providing advisory, uh, sharing knowledge, and linking, uh, you know, doing venture development programs and also linking you to possible finances and markets. Um, today, we know that the, the foundation of any new economy is about making, you know, that right decision to help you either uh, transit or, or, you know, consume some certain, some certain products. Um, there's been lasting conversations in Nigeria around, uh, you know, energy transfer, uh, you know, en uh, energy transition, circularity, and name it. But for us, we think, we, we think that the only way that we can explore a sustainable future is when we also, you know, take critical steps and attempt, uh, you know, to purchase goods that are within that green and that whole sustainable economy. Um, and what we're trying to share with you today are some of the insights of people who trade within that sector, uh, you know, from renewable energy to recycling to, um, uh, you know, sustainable farming and co. And then we thought that as a group, we should have this conversation with you, share some of these insights, and also unveil, uh, you know, the green startup .org ng, uh, green startup ng program that we held, uh, you know, that we designed to help ventures scale across Nigeria. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a very wonderful time. Please make sure you ask questions, and then we can share more. Cheers. All right, thank you very much. Um, without wasting any of our time, I'll quickly introduce our speakers for today. Please uh, help me welcome Mr. Olumide Do on stage. All right, also let me welcome Jennifer Ochendu. Welcome, Jennifer. Wait, you want to balance? All right, and also help me welcome Mr. Obi Charles Nena. All right, thank you very much, everyone. So again. I'll just lay the foundation of um, this conversation, which is based on exploring green innovation for a sustainable future. Um, we've all been talking about sustainability. These days, you can, hardly, you can hardly have any conversation right now without anybody throwing words like sustainability and all about what sustainability is about and how it relates to Nigeria and also individuals, young individuals. So um, our conversation today will be based on that. So um, for me to start, I think I will just let you guys um, introduce yourself and what you do, then um, I'll pick up from there. So let me start with you, um, Olumide. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Olumide Ido. I'm the co-founder of International Climate Change Development Initiative. And what we do basically is to create a climate smart generation across Nigeria and Africa. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is engineer Obi Charles Nana, the founder and CEO of Kaltani. And we are a clean tech, plastic recycling, and waste management company located right here in Lagos, Nigeria, with operations in four states. Thank you. You guys are acting like you're shy to clap. Clap for Obi, though. He does amazing work. <laughs> Good to see you all. My name is Jennifer Uchendu. I'm the founder of Susti Vibes. And as the name sounds, I make sustainability cool, relatable, and actionable for young people in Nigeria and now Africa, thankfully. I always trust Jennifer to bring this energy in the room. <laughs> I can always bank on it. All right. Uh, I won't like to waste any of our time. We'll just go straight into the conversation. And I'm going to start with you, Olumide. Um, you've been championing the 
knowledge sharing, um, advocating for youth, and um, talking about green innovation and always driving the cause. I mean, if you're in the green space, almost everybody in the green space understands what we've been doing. So I would like you to just lay a quick foundation on what do you really think um, green innovation is and how does it relate to the youth? Okay, thank you very much. Um, for me, green innovation is, uh, you know, when you come up with something that is uh, like a product that is solving sustainable or sustainable issue or solving environmental problem. And this problem must be a problem that is creating investment opportunity, both for young people and the environment we are staying. I think that is a sum, uh, summary of uh, green innovation because uh, innovation or innovative idea that is not building investment in young people or building investment for a particular problem, then it is not really an innovation. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, like you've laid the foundation for what green innovation is. I will quickly like to jump to um, Jennifer. Um, everybody knows you've been building a strong community, trying to push for um, sustainability and make the whole green space cool, like you've mentioned. So what do you think is the role of um, community in building this kind of sustainable future you want? Um, I'm always a fan of clusters, um, solution to problems because I believe the more we have, the merrier. So um, what is the role of community and how can we build a sustainable community for um, green innovation? Sure, thank you very much for that question. I think when we think of the idea of sustainability, what comes to mind is sustainability of what and sustainability for who. So the who part of it is where community comes in. If your green innovation is not serving people, then there's a gap there. It's literally not an innovation. So people, you know, we think about sustainability from a triple bottom line approach. So welcome to class for Sustainability 101. It's about people, it's about the planet, and it's about the economy as it were. So if we miss the part about people, then we start to make a mistake because your sustainable idea, your innovation needs to serve people. And that's where community comes to play. And community can be youth, it can be stakeholders, it can be investors, but we're saying the people side of things shouldn't be left behind because those are the people who would engage with your idea, engage with your advocacy plan. So it has to be centered around supporting people, ensuring that people are empowered they have agency to participate, they feel included, and that they really, really understand the goal of what you're trying to sustain. At the end of the day, if we protect the environment and we don't protect and support the people in it, then we're really missing the point about what sustainability is. So it's people's protection, planet protection, and also their prosperity at the same time. Thank you. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh... All right, um, we've all heard about the role of people. So now, um, in as much as we all have um, our roles to play individually from our point of view, what about the um, entrepreneurs and the SMEs who are probably driving this innovation? And that's why uh, the big man here is going to help us probably elaborate on uh, the role of entrepreneurs. I mean, innovators like you are like the engine room for, for green innovations. and. You guys are the reason why probably there are investments, products, and even services in this space. So uh, what does the future really look like for aspiring innovators that are seeking to get into this space? Because um, there are so many doubts about sustainability. What if there's next COVID? What does the future really hold for um, green innovation? Uh, the future is super bright. Uh, there's a saying that goes, there is no uh, idea like an idea whose time has come. And honestly speaking, green innovation, um, entrepreneurship in the circular space or the renewable space or anything sustainable, the time is literally now. The real question is, can you take your, your idea from idea into solution and into action? A lot of times, a lot of us are stuck in what we will do, how we're going to do it the idea, the PowerPoint, the Excel spreadsheet, but no one is really ready to get out there, put the boots on the ground, and get to work. 
So if you can channel that idea into solution, actionable solution, then literally the sky becomes your foundation because the amount of opportunity in this space is quite ridiculous. If you look at waste management as a whole in Africa, we're talking about currently over a $50 billion industry. The next three years, a $100 billion industry. If we look at Nigeria, specifically plastic recycling in its own, the $10 billion industry. So it really doesn't matter what you're looking at, if you're looking at the solar space, the recycling space, the waste management space, afforestation, literally any area in this ecosystem is invest investment worthy, investable, and great returns too. I hope that answers your question, sir. All right, yeah, for now I'll let you go. <laughs> All right, uh, please pardon me, I would like to um, bring off stage our last um, panel for today. Uh, please help me welcome Mrs. Abimbola Olufo. When she, when she gets here, you understand the importance of her being on the stage. All right, you're welcome, ma. All right, just for introduction, can you please introduce yourself and what you do and why it's very important for you to be on stage? <laughs> can you hear me? Okay, I must apologize ahead because I have um, a flu, so my voice is not very audible. But the question again, please. Um, just introduce yourself and okay. what you do. My name is Abimbola Olufore Wakeliff and I head the Investment and Technology Promotion Office of the UN Industrial Development Organization. Thank you. All right, and I will let you rest, or Sesu, before I ask you <laughs> the next question. Um, Obi, Obi just told us about how um, the space of innovators and entrepreneurs and the importance of investment and how beautiful the future is for green innovation. And there is no way we can talk about this without the importance of investment. So um, what kind of investment do you think the green innovation space needs for it to enhance and explore the different opportunities in the space? Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. So as cliche as it may sound, it needs green funds. And when you say green funds, it's a medley of um, very patient funding because when you're talking about innovation and sustainability, they're not quick ROI investments. So you can't uh, possibly be looking to, um, maybe first off, trying to leverage venture capitalists because you wouldn't really get the type of understanding required to deliver something that has to be slow and steady as well as um, future-proofed. So when we're talking green funding, a lot of times what this encompasses, and I like the, the um, uh, definition that you gave to it, but, um, and in addition to her definition, one of the things with green innovation is like looking into the future and asking ourselves how are we going to deliver a low carbon future where everybody is carried along, no one is left behind. So when you look at it along the whole spectrum of the sustainable development goals, you're checking each box to ensure that what you're doing in terms of investing, in terms of ideating, in terms of you know, finding yourself in the solution space as a young entrepreneur, as a new startup, you and your friend are thinking about what can we do to make a difference and be resourceful and make profit. You're thinking of future-proofing. So I always tell people that when you see the startups come up, get encouraged, not because that startup has stolen your idea, but because that idea has a lot of latitude to, for value. And in adding that value, all you have to think about is 
what is five years ahead of this solution that we have today, right? And you're beginning to think about the sustainable development goals, how you're going to include them in that current solution, and boom, you have your new solution, and you are the next big startup of tomorrow. So I'll stop there for now. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So uh, one thing that I liked about what you mentioned, about what, what you said was um, making sure nobody's left behind. Yes, and um, I'll throw this question to you, Jennifer. Um, whenever we talk about green innovation or clean tech, we only have these um, usual suspects, renewable energy, circularity, but the climate impacts, um, almost every sector feels the climate impacts. So how do we get um, innovators um, the private sector, public sector, to talk about other sectors that are being impacted by climate change, but others are not talking about it. I mean, even education, health sector, they are not the uh, forefront of um, climate tech or clean tech or green innovation, and they are all being affected. So how do you think we can use community to make sure every other sectors that are being affected by climate change are being talked about? Well, that's a very good question, and you almost kind of answered it because that's where community plays in. When we think of climate change, for me, it's everything change because it's affecting our health, our food. You know, there are different areas where climate change is starting to impact lives, and if people recognize that and they start to see a solutions lens, so think about how do we solve problems in after floods, for example, there's a lot of disease spread spreading. There's a climate and health connection there. So if you have an innovation to solve that problem, you're inadvertently solving the climate change problem and also the health crisis at the same time. So it's a lot of community. It takes advocacy. So oftentimes people underplay the role of advocacy, the role of educating and sensitizing people. We're not used to this culture of knowing how to be sustainable. You know, we've grown to a lifestyle of waste, fast food. You know, they call it the microwave generation as it were, where we're just used to just going on the move. It takes community, it takes, you know, advocates and people going out to the streets, going out on social media, talking and opening people's minds to possibilities to see that there can be another way, you know, to see that there are other opportunities that we can think. And the truth is not everyone will be an innovator, yeah? But we also need to, on the consumer side of things, embrace this idea. So I might not be in the recycling space, but I should recycle, yeah? So we have that conversation where we all see ourselves as stakeholders, and that's how we you know, build inclusion. Where even though I'm not in the business, I'm also supporting the business. I'm also living what I'm preaching, you know, living what I'm understanding. I think that's how we change the conversation. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I like what you said. You, you might not be a uh, it might not be recycling, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't recycle things. It also means that the fact that you're not an innovator in that space doesn't mean you can't do the advocacy. And I'll throw the question back to you, um, Holy Media, about advocacy and educating. Um, congrats to you. I, I read yesterday that you won 20,000 grants to... <laughs> it's the man with the money. <laughs> to, to mobilize youth and educate and advocate youth. And, uh, what strategies do you use? Because you've been in this space for the past five, over a decade. I don't want to quote you or say anything I'm not meant to say. But you've been in this space for a while. And what strategies have been using that's been working for you to get more use and more um, green innovators into this space? Uh, for the kind of grants you won, what kind of strategies will you use to get the right people into this space? Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> So uh, for me, you know, it's, it's about um, passion. It's about your dedication to what you're doing. And one thing again is um, most people don't even understand that people are watching. Do you get it? And it's something that gets, I remember my first grant was $2,100. And it was true, you know, I can do it. Just take my concept note, you know. But w one thing I want to say here is, um, in everything you are doing today, there's no how. Somebody somewhere is actually watching. So for me, let me just bring this to your notice, you know. I don't know you, but I got to know you from a friend that attended the same church with you. And I looked you up on LinkedIn, and I was like, wow. So somebody like this is in, in Lagos, and I don't know. 
And I've been in Lagos for a couple of years. But the point here is, what I'm trying to say is, somewhere, somebody somewhere looking at what you are doing. And what brought the conversation was, oh, there's a lot of people doing recycling in Lagos. But yet, we are still having the same problem. What is going on? So it's, it's just a conversation of making yourself, you know, available at the, the right time. For me, I started back in school. And one of the best ways for me, I, I always used to get fun, is that you will never see me keeping quiet every event I go to. Even if there's no question, I will ask. Just for people to understand that I want to learn and I want to know what is going on. We just finished a session on carbon credits. Carbon capture. I always ask myself, how many young people in Nigeria even understand carbon credits? You know, there's a lot of things in this climate space or in this innovation space that every one of us need to learn. Somebody is doing pickup. Somebody is doing the uh, uh, billing. And somebody is doing the, uh, uh, what they call it, the actual recycling. The space is very, very big. But for me, I focus more on attitude. Uh, for you and I to understand that there's something we need to learn before we get to where we are going to. And if it comes to innovation, there's a lot of innovation around education and advocacy that doesn't really need you to turn something to another thing. By telling one or two people what the importance of climate change all is all about, is something that can get to where you are going to. I got the grant, just the virtue of somebody just reached out to me and said, ah, there's this grant out there, go for it. And I applied and I got it. To be very sincere with you guys, some of the grants I've been getting is always a referral. Some of them, I don't see them. Some of them, okay, check this out. And I keep checking on it. And one thing again I will end by saying is this. It's also very important for us to learn, to read. If I can say, let me just ask a random question here. How many of us have actually gone through the climate change policy, um, yeah, policy of Nigeria? How many of us? How many of us know that we have two waste management policy in Federal Ministry of Environment today? How many of us have seen it? No. How many of us can tell me who are the stakeholders that is on the Climate Change Council board? Nobody. Even the youth representing us on the Climate Change Council. How many of us know the person? So there are little things that we need to put attention in so that by the time you want to make case for that project you are doing, you have something you can refer to. For me, any project I implement must be part of implementation of the government strategy. Because by the time I want to talk to people, I want to talk to people based on what the government said they want to do by 2030, 2060. You know, uh, in Paris, in, yeah, in COP26, the president said we are reducing our emission by 2060. Do you know that in Lagos State, every action that we are taking, whether in waste, water, is contributing to that action in 2060. But none of us know that what you are doing in your own area is actually contributing. So, for me, I think all of us need to start looking at how to even get engaged, to understand what the Nigerian government wants to do when it comes to climate action. I'm not saying that uh, we should get involved in politics, but I'm just trying to let you know that there's a lot of policies that can actually help you to grow that proposal. Like you said, those PowerPoints you are putting together, the narrative of how you want to you know, meet the needs of people and how you want to make sure that you are taken back or you, are, uh, uh, you don't leave anybody behind and you are making sure that you are creating a value chain across the world. And let me end by saying this, and this is what I always tell people. The climate space has moved from advocacy now to investment. And that's why I said in my question in the last session that if you look at the private sector presently, they are ready to invest. But we as activists, we are saying that they are polluting the environment. But how do we make, want to make sure that these people invest more into innovation? What they will say is that there must be money for money. So in other words, every action we are taking now, let us think about investment opportunity. Because you cannot continue to do advocacy and you don't have something to lay back and say, yes, this is what we've been able to achieve and get back. And my brother that's doing recycling, it's not for free. Exactly. So we are looking at investment opportunity that will drive innovation and will drive opportunity for all of us in this space. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Bulumide. Uh, I'll go back to Obino. 
continuing from what um, Olumide mentioned about um, investment and all, I, you are one person I'm so certain that I've raised a lot of investment. I mean, if many recyclers, few of us can be a witness, are talking about recycling companies that have done a lot, a lot in Nigeria and raised money, Kautani will come to people's mind. So what are the attributes? And because as NCIC, when we incubate businesses at very early stage and innovations and all, they will ask you who are the guys in this space that have actually raised money, that have made investments. What have they done right? What are things they've been able to put together to be able to assess this kind of funding? And I know you've raised some sizable amount of money. What are those attributes that green innovators need to have at the early stage and even as they um, saturate and as they scale? What are the attributes that they need to be able to raise the kind of investment that they need? So <clears throat> that's a great question. And I guess I'll take you through a little story, right? So my background was actually in the energy space, so they call it now. Back then, we called it the oil and gas sector. Spent some time working in America, in the oil fields of Texas and Oklahoma, in the south of France, moved back to Nigeria, still found myself in oil. I finally said enough was enough. I want to be part of the solution and less of the problem. And that's how Kaltani was formed. Then when we got started, I put money I'd saved up, raised money from friends I worked with in the energy space in 2019, and we were able to raise $1.5 million. The idea there was to build out our factory, get a truck, um, get some balers, and get a whole recycling line and a lab. Because the idea would be to build the plants and produce products that could be sold anywhere in the world. And it just so happened, our process was efficient enough, we were able to export our products and sell in Europe and North America. But even at that, we knew we were barely scratching the surface. I knew we'd have to go back to the market to raise more money to expand. So April of last year, we raised $4 million. We raised that to build out more collection infrastructure across some key states. We raised it to buy some more spare parts, buy some more trucks, because at Kaltani, we run the entire gamut of plastic recycling. So that means we collect the plastic waste at the collection centers, we sort and segregate it by plastic type and plastic color. We compress it and bale it with our balers, transport it to our factory where it's processed, hot washed and recycled for the PET, and hot washed and recycled and pelletized for the HDPE, LDPE, and PP. And after that, we have a laboratory at the factory where we test our products to ensure it meets the specification of our customers, irrespective of who you are. From the biggest customer to the smallest customer, we test all our products. Then we export to you, either to make brand new bottles or polyester fiber or more packaging, as the case may be. Because our goal is to reduce the amount of virgin plastic in circulation and increase the amount of recycled content in plastic products. But even at that, we still realize we are barely scratching the surface. The problem of plastic waste and waste management in general in Nigeria and Africa at large is monumental. So we understand that Kaltani, we must do everything in our power to increase essentially the amount of investment coming into us to keep or exceed the pace of plastic waste going into society. So currently, we're currently raising $20 million. And we intend to close it this year by the end of Q2 latest or Q1. So we can further expand some more states, build more plastic recycling machines, build more collection centers, buy more trucks, so we can reduce the amount of plastic waste currently polluting our oceans, um, polluting our landfills, polluting, polluting our environments. So essentially, in raising money, you must be honest in what you say you're going to do. You must also do what you say you're going to do. You must also understand that you must be willing to give what I mean by give is give a, per, a percentage of your organization 
in, in the event you're raising equity. Then you must also understand not all money is good money. Um, the madam over there spoke about patient capital. You don't want a situation where you're raising money because you're, you get money and before you know it, your organization goes belly up because you cannot pay your debts. Because make no mistake, the industry has its challenges. The infrastructure to run the entire industry is not there. So as we're building our organizations, we're also building out the infrastructure to run the organization. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's some of the things we've done at Kaltani to remain afloat, and some of the things we will keep doing to expand our operations, scale our operations. So we're always looking for concessionary loan, decent equity, or grant financing. And it just so happens, we actually haven't raised any significant amount of grants. Out of the $5.5 million we've raised, we've only raised $20,000 in grant money. Everything else is investable money, and we're doing everything in our power to show economic returns for our investors and our stakeholders, as well as keep the environment clean. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I mean, it's music to my ear to hear you speak about raising $20 million. It just shows um, there are months of opportunities in this space. And um, it's from uh, entrepreneurial space. I would like to come back to you and Bimbola as uh, a key um, stakeholder in the investment space. Um, I want you to speak from the lens of an investor on how and things that innovators are meant to do. Because um, apart from not very little percentage of um, innovators are like Kaltani that have been able to raise substantial amount of money. A lot of great innovators are still at the crash level, not even probably making any investment, probably still looking for a few grants of 1,000, 2,000 just to r remain afloat. So w from an um, investor's point of view, what do you think innovators need to do to get those? Because from what he's saying, there are so many opportunities. He has raised $5.5 million already. That means there's so much investment and money coming to the space. So what can other upcoming innovators do to actually, from your own perspective, to be able to scratch the surface and make this kind of, um, raise this kind of money? Okay, so when it comes to waste management, it's a very, very interesting um, area of focus for investors. Um, but one of the things that we need to understand is skill, right? drives impact, and that drives the invest, investor's interest. So when you look at plastics, for example, plastics constitutes about 10% of the actual solid waste that exists in Nigeria alone, right? There's still 90% out there that's not, I wouldn't say untapped, but barely tapped, right? Um, in December, we did a visit to uh, geocycle in Ewekoro, where they actually have a waste, um, a geocycle plant for waste management. And it was surprising to find out that one of the major issues that they had was that they had no waste to process. But then there are waste in, you know, um, waste fields all over Lagos State and everything. And then there's the issue of a very fantastic world-class facility being located in Ogun State, albeit borderline. And there's just no logistics because the trucks, they're not, you don't have trucks equipped enough to move the waste. And the cost of moving the waste relative to probably just abandoning it because there's no consequences, right, is almost, um, it's too high. And this is where advocacy comes in. Right? Because we need to use advocacy to drive sustainable development. If people do not begin to agitate to say that waste has to be properly managed, if people do not start to manage their waste from homes, then you would not get anybody interested in investing in waste management. But when you have, you know, um, organizations that are focusing on driving this change, on ensuring First and foremost, there's a log logistics problem for moving waste, right? Everybody collects plastics, and I know different, you know, collection points around Lagos, around 
Ogun State and everything. And you have a facility where one line is down completely because it, is, it does not make any sense to run both lines because one, the first line is not even utilized optimally. And we saw piles of palm kernel, we saw piles of tire, you know, chopped um, tire waste, and all types of waste. Plastic is even like easy, and you find these waste all over Nigeria, right? But there's nobody incentivized enough to move this waste to a geocycle, to, you know, a waste management facility, or probably it's also the location of waste management facilities as strategic locations around the country, right? That would be, when you look at it relative to logistics, maybe the rail lines and stuff like that, it can then become an opportunity. So it takes government, it takes a lot of research, it takes a lot of looking at the assist situation and mapping out, you know, what to do in a very practical way, right, for investors to be interested, right? We work in a very difficult terrain in Nigeria. One of the things that I said when I noticed the logistics problem to Ewekoro was, but well, there's a rail line that actually passes from Lagos to Ewekoro on its way to Ogun State. Why isn't there a stop? Why isn't there a stop? Why can't, you know, a few cargoes transport waste? So there has to be advocacy. There has to be institutional strengthening, you know, within government to help them to understand that you have to put a system around things for it to work. Because if there's no system in place, startups are going to agitate to find solutions, but the system will frustrate them and investors will not support it. Because investors can support fantastic ideas, but there has to be a system, right, that is underlining that idea to become a, a proper innovation and a solution for them to invest. And it's unfortunate that the startups you see here, there's nothing we can really do, except of course we begin to look critically at what that startup bill entails. Like he said, the policy on waste management, what is it, what are states doing, what are the advocacy um, bodies doing in terms of, you know, elimination of waste? And then you're looking at it also from a hearts and minds perspective about even getting people to understand that this waste, right, has to be managed because it translates into wealth. And people are not just littering anyhow. They are collecting, they are separating as need be. And um, so there's... There's opportunity in that space where it needs to be structured for investors to be interested. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I would quickly like to also take that back to Jennifer. Um, just like you said, a lot of things need to be structured and also a lot of things need to be simplified. Um, we've had so many people who talk about not even understanding the whole grammar in the policy that Olamide, Olamide mentioned, because I've seen people try to read all those policy. They will tell you there are big grammars we don't even understand. So how do we simplify terms like that? And the reason why I'm asking you is because I've seen the way you've used social medias across the geopolitical zone in Nigeria, choir, circles, everywhere, your, your, your um, um, community is, to try and make it simple for youth to understand what all these policies mean, what all these big grammars in the whole green space. Some people don't even understand what sustainability is because of the whole big grammar everybody always blow. I mean, COP27, by the time you see the reports, 80% of people don't even understand the, the negotiation and everything, yeah? But we've been able to break it down. So what is the role of social media and how can we break down these big terms and this big grammar to the community for them to understand? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. Breaking down the technical jargons <laughs> uh, of sustainability. But if we look at the idea of sustainability, everyone uses waste. You know, we deal with waste. So that's something that you can immediately relate to. And then you look at our gutters and our drainage, you see that same plastic. So it's easy to have a conversation with someone. 
I think where social media comes to play is when we relate it to everyday life and lifestyle. When we talk about what happens in the negotiation room as, you know, things that affect us every day. You talk about air pollution, for example. If there is a bill against air pollution and you tell people about suits in Port Harcourt, they can immediately relate to that because it's something that they've seen. So it's about using our local language, having conversations that young people can immediately relate to. One of the things that we're learning at Susty Vibes is also the role of the creative sector, the role of pop culture. You know, we've always done movie screenings, using arts, you know, all of the different ways to talk about sustainability. But we also need our so-called influencers, you know, our celebrities to get on board with these conversations. That's the only way we can make it mainstream. That's the only way we can have massive, large conversations. You know, over the holidays, I know there was an actor that was talking about people littering, and it went viral. And I was like, this is something we've been talking about every day. But we need these people to talk about these things because they bring massive influence to the conversation. And with social media, again, it's not just about you know talking about the technicalities. We also need to highlight the solution. So if you're on social media, you see someone who's doing something really amazing, retweet their story, share their story, talk about it. That's how we make these things popular. When we make it you know, cool and exciting for, so it's not just about sustainability, people promoting sustainability, it's everyone promoting and talking about it. If you have someone, you know someone who's doing recycling, you know, talk about their business, tell someone about it. That's how we make it mainstream. It's really about making it mainstream. Right now, it's still very niche. A lot of people don't know about it. It's only people who are looking to recycle are going. But if everyday people like us start to promote these conversations, it becomes you know, what people are talking about. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'll quickly come back to you, Abimbo, about um, the role of um, collaboration. She mentioned so many things that was coming together to do a lot of things here. Yeah. So what are the role of collaboration? And when I mean collaboration, I'm not, I'm not just talking about uh, social media, like she said, in investment, development. Um, if you look at some s sectors in Nigeria that are doing well, you see, I always don't want to use FinTech, but FinTech is actually doing well, so let me just use it. it, it some people even tell you that it's like a small cause. You see them, any small gathering, you always see them with each other's boots and call. So what are the role of collaboration to, to help us build a sustainable future in green innovation? What role does collaboration has to play? And what are the discussions that should lead such collaboration? Is it investment? Is it development? Is it social impact? What, are, what should be the driving, uh, driving indicators for those collaborations to come together? Okay, thanks for your question. Um, collaboration, of course, we know is key. Is key. And um, when you're looking at collaboration, first of all, looking at it from a funding perspective, um, a lot of times you find um, like grants giving bodies that um, would probably offer very low grants as low as probably $1,000 to maybe $25,000. That cannot really amount to anything, right? But so for us as um, a project office here in Nigeria, it's to actually see how we can get them in as collaborative partners and see how we can create a bucket of funding that then becomes um, tangible, commensurate to the requests that we have. Because when you look at what we do in UNIDO, it's um, actually industrial development. We're out to drive skill, right? But it has to be sustainable industrial development so that you don't, you take people away from doing things in silos and, you know, small scale to achieving large scale and industrializing things. So when you look at waste management, it has to be at industrial scale, not just small scale silo kind of operations. When you're trying to look at the funding as well, we want to be able to support with suggesting, you know, an aggregation of funding um, sources that would help to drive that scale. We want to look at it from also a technology perspective where there's collaborative um, technology that will help 
you know, to drive, you know, same scale. Because when some of the things uh, that inhibit achieving scale is probably doing things in, with manual labor, whereas you have machinery, you have technology in other climes that have been developed that can actually do a thousand times as much as what is currently going on. So on that note, we try to do a lot of um, delegate missions to get in, uh, SMEs to see what's happening in other clients so that they can come back here to replicate it, but not just come back to Nigeria or anywhere within Africa to replicate it, but they have you know, also brought that signed um, like technology matchmaking or investment matchmaking and they, they are assured of support, you know, both with funding and with the right type of technology to come back and actually um, drive scale in their respective businesses. All right, thank you very much. Um, I would like to take one or two questions, then we'll run off the session. All right, do you have a mic? All right, your name and please go straight to the question. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Isaac. I work for Telecommunication and Technology Sustainability Working Group. And I was really interested in this particular session. And just as the conversations were going on, something came to mind, I thought to ask. Um, how are enterprises in green innovation looking to drive the narrative for climate education. So what specific strategies are they looking at? If I could direct my question to Mr. OB and um, Mr. Ola, Mr. Olimide, please pardon me. So what specific strategies are they looking at to driving climate education? Because he mentioned that, okay, it's a $10 billion industry, but people do not know these things. An average person that drops plastic on the road thinks it's creating jobs. So how do we drive this? All right, in 10 seconds. So um, for me, I will still go. So um, I'm, I'm saying this based on my understanding of the government process. And I can, I don't know if you, have you heard about the Climate Promise Fund? The Climate Promise. Have you heard about it by UNGP? So, a uh, couple of like two, three years ago, we have uh, they, they came up with a strategy, starting from basic class to primary and to secondary. But the problem is, how do we get those materials to schools? So there is, like I said, there's a lot of things going on in the government with the uh, some institutions that we from the civil society need to actually pay attention to. So if you want to demand for climate, like if you look at Lagos State uh, uh, climate change, or let, let me say the education curriculum, do we have climate change education in the curriculum? And if you see the gaps between the state and the environment, it's something that we also need to question about. So I just want you to put it there that if you write to, if you write to, uh, to UNDP or you write to Minister of Environment, there's a strategy they've put in place through the climate promise. We have it from, I think the project was implemented by NCF, Nigeria Conservation uh, 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 Foundation. So there's a lot going on. It's just that most of, I will be doing a project on climate education, and that material is one of my indicators I'm going to be using. So if all of us can do that, then we'll be able to understand that something is happening, but it's just that we don't know about it. All right, please. He said he has answered it. <laughs> all right, so um, I'm afraid we will not be able to take so much question because um, there is an unveiling that has to happen in after this. But please, you can, we have about 15 minutes after the session to just probably walk up to any of our panels, um, seeking their permission, then you can ask your question. So please, can we just gather to uh, take a group pictures, then we'll have an unveiling that will happen immediately now. Please, can My final. All right.
All right, thank you so much. Please, a warm round of applause for my, um, my panels again. So uh, before we go, there is an unveiling and uh, a video that is going to play now. Uh, a lot of questions about how entrepreneurs can get into this space and get funding. So I'll quickly uh, like to invite Mr. Olam Tora Bankole for the unveiling. Please, can you um, give me a warm round of applause? All right, so it's called Green Startup NG. Um, it's going to quickly talk about it, then we'll unveil it, then you can all tap in into the um, prospect of the Green Startup NG. Thank you very much, Tosin. Um, so uh, the NCIC, as, as I said earlier, is a venture development center, and we try to look for new ways to scale businesses, start with new ventures, build new models, um, try and upgrade all the types of existing models you have from the Bola guys to the, you know, the plastic and co. Um, because we know that building ventures is very key and then every venture is trying to look for money and everybody says that, oh, how do we find people that are going to give us money? Uh, you've listened to some of the uh, words that the panelists have shared and it's all about traction. As long as you started making some, le some level of traction, finding investment has some level of possibility. So what do we do? Because we know that we have, we have incubated over 60 startups in the past four years, and about 20 to 30% of them have scaled up to growth, growth stage level, we feel that this is the right time for us to start to show businesses that have traction and they are ready to meet up to the scale method. And then we came up with the green startup uh, .ng, which we call it Nigeria's pioneer marketplace for green businesses. Um, the platform itself is um, it's, um, registration based and the registration is based on assessment. Um, there are spots for investors, there are spots for ventures and um, even ventures that have not trained from the NCIC. Um, that's the, the website is live, you can log in. Is there a short video? Are we doing that short video? So the website itself is live and then you can log in, you, can, you, you, know, you can register um, if an investor likes you, they can book for a, for a session with you. Um, maybe I keep quiet. as short as that. A round of applause for us, please. So uh, when you sign up on this platform, investors, businesses, partners, market, uh, you know, market openers or penetrators also want to see you. And um, the reason why here we are not going to be taking businesses with only ideas or addition based. If you're into startups or if you're building a startup, there are different phases you are, you know, you're in. For here, we're dealing with revenue based businesses. That means that you must share simple things like your, you know, your, your audited accounts, you know, your business model, you know, your, your traction value, your sales value. We would like to see what you're selling because, again, early stage ventures that want to raise money really need to make sure that they have tested their product and it is market friendly, meaning that you have gotten into the market. Um, but for us here, we're looking beyond you just getting into the market. We're looking at businesses who have been there for about two years, three years, um, who, have, who have raised or rather who have raised some level of revenue or rather, you know, open up, you know, some level of market. And with that, we think that we can help you scale faster when you come to the green startup, uh, ng. Thank you so much. And it was a pleasure talking to you. And I hope you sign up and then we can review your startup. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Thank you for um, listening. Like I said, some of our panels and even um, Bank Holly and some of my colleagues are around. If you need to know more about the startup, ng, um, startup, Green Startup NG, please, you can walk up to any of us. We can give you more information about it. It's very intentional and it's very, very good to be instrumental for startups to raise money in Nigeria and how we've had so many conversations about the challenges of how to raise funding and the limitations. 
this startup, green startup NG is one of the components that we can use to raise money for green um, um, startups. So please, you can ask questions. You can go online to check what it's about and sign up your green innovations. And you can also spread the news across to your network of uh, innovators, green innovators, to sign up and get using the startup, green startup NG for them to be able to raise money, meet potential investors and potential partners and potential markets. Thank you so much for your time.